Good morning. And Good morning. Welcome to, <laughs> and welcome to the Be More News Morning Show. Marcia Jews, how are you? I'm just wonderful. Thank you. How are you? How's everybody? Great. Kavet, Kavet Kane, you're looking quite exuberant this morning. Thank you. I'm doing well also. And you guys. And how are you, Donnie? Wonderful. You had a question for Marcia. Yes, I did. Um, I noticed the new banner behind What's you. What's the and damn I banner? See, see, come back. We're going to bring it up. <laughs> What's the damn banner? <laughs> give me a chance to get right, my right, presentation. All right, all right, all right, all right, try it again. Try it again. Okay. So, Marsha, I was wondering, what is that banner behind you? That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Bea. The Bea banner for the Black Engineer of the Year Awards Conference that's coming up. February the 11th through the 13th. Nice. And it is the largest gathering of Black people in science, technology, engineering, and math. And they've been around for 35 years. And we're very excited. Yes, it's huge. And the, the company that owns it is Career Communications Group, which is headquartered right here in Baltimore, downtown at the Inner Harbor. Awesome. And you know, it's very interesting. They also have this conference here, but they also are uh, giving out awards during this time. There are more than a hundred winners. So throughout Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you will find all types of events that are celebrating people of color in STEM, from the Stars and Stripes to young people to historical uh, Black colleges and universities, HBCUs. They have a luncheons with awards. Outstanding. We're going to get more with more specificity. We have the list of uh, the top winners now. So we'll be starting to interview some of those. And we have the Stars and Stripes, which are all of the engineers and the technologists in the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. And it is just a phenomenal organization. Uh, the top uh, sponsors for more than 30 years, Lockheed Martin, General Motors, and Boeing. And there's a list of more of those people who've been supporting this organization for 35 years. And that's huge. It's a Black family-owned business. Mm -hmm. And so what we'll be doing over the course, Donnie has been kind enough to uh, work with Career Communications Group for us to be able to celebrate all of the activities here on this show. So I'm deeply honored and um, just excited about it. Now, they have opened up the registration, the CEO, Dr. Tyrone D. Taborn. And if you go to BEA.org, you'll be able to register and learn more information about scheduling and all of that that you need to know. It's huge. You're smiling, Kavet. What? Yeah, no, I just, I love that this event is being held in Baltimore. I love that you're so energized by it. <laughs> um, and to think of, you know, the opportunity um, to maybe attend, I, I would love to, you know, be there and, and to see what's going on with the well, Black Engineers of the Year's award. Well, this year it's virtual because okay. of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and it started here. And then they moved to Philadelphia. They tried it in Philadelphia and then they moved to Washington. But under um, Tyrone Taborn's leadership, Dr. T is what we call him. Mm -hmm. And Al Hutchinson, the conference is coming back in the next couple of years. But this year it's going to be virtual. And mm -hmm. we have another pro uh, program called the Women of Color, which was held last October in Detroit. and. It was wonderful and it was virtual. Nice. So I've had that experience and it is, you you know that you're not there and you know the camaraderie is so wonderful when you are there to see all these amazing people doing things that we had never even heard of and they're creating mm -hmm. them, they're designing them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 
it's I cried through the whole time. Oh. <laughs> Well, I because it's very touching to have our people coming together in this way, mm -hmm. you know, especially with the different situations mm -hmm. that we have experienced this year. This year was very traumatic for everyone, you know, those in our community and even those outside of our community who are watching the things that are happening to our community and don't really have a whole lot of power to make a difference immediately. The challenge mm -hmm. is for us to, to maintain the momentum and to continue uh, making a difference where we can. Well, and you know, if we're sitting here talking about that STEM is so important and we want our kids to be in, in STEM, but mm -hmm. they don't have anybody around them that looks like them, then how can you see yourself there if you don't even know what there is? And so when we look at this and they have a magazine as well, the Black Engineer and Information Technology Magazine, Good. and they have a program called the TAP Program, Technology Awareness Program, which has curriculum and some other things. But it's real critical that we show these people, people who are literally creating technology, creating programming that is changing the trajectory of how people are doing business. They're creating systems. So if you're in Lockheed or uh, General Motors or IBM, Mark Dean created, he was one of the Black Engineers of the Year while I was there. And let me tell you something. He wrote the original and created the original personal computer. He's black. And so that that's just off the top of my head. There are hundreds, literally thousands over a 35 year period of all of these people who have given tremendously to all of these corporations and to products that we use, products that corp other corporations use, products that help defend our nation. And so when you look at all of that, you say, how is it possible that we, this is not a household word and we want BEA.org to be a household word. We want everybody to be thinking black engineer of the year. And how can my child, how can my neighbor, how can my family aspire and go through a process to learn about all of these people and all the things that they have done and we hear about all the negative ugliness in the world and, and from our about our community. But there is a whole nother world of who we are, not only in STEM, but in all in the arts and everything else. And it's, right. it, it's incumbent upon us to have organizations like this that we lift up to be certain that our community and the world sees who we really are and the core of who we are as a people and our intelligence. Absolutely. Right? We look yeah, at Catherine Johnson. Yes, that's so ahead. significant. You talk about um, the children in our in our community being influenced and encouraged to reach for more. Um, you know, oftentimes a person doesn't believe that they're capable unless they see the example, or maybe they have a dream, but there is no encouragement. You know, so even if there is no example, just having the encouragement makes such a huge difference. That's and with right. January being Mentorship Month, it is an awesome opportunity for us to focus in on not just having those who are in these higher positions reaching back to the kids because there's so many kids who need that kind of encouragement, maybe putting out the messages and, and sharing you know, what they've learned in different forums and formats. And this obviously is going to be one way that would be very key for kids to be able to pay attention or even to have a, an opportunity to to hear you know about what's going on with the recognition we talked yesterday a lot about you know football and basketball and you know how they're getting so recognized from the yep. beginning of the process you know where they're being recruited into those teams and into those uh that work that field of work um but how are we doing with promoting these fields of work, you right. know, which are so critical for our kids to to, and they're they they're interested. I mean, every kid is interested in video games. You know, that's right. if you start there, then you right. can go. Anywhere. And they can design the game. They can yeah. learn how to design the game. And, and my, my son was designing games when he was, you know, twelve years old. You know, and I told him at that time because I did homeschool with him since he was. I started homeschooling him when he was three, but by the time he got to that point where he's learning, you know, five different programming languages and he's creating apps and video games and all stuff, I just told him 
him, I says, you know, I don't know all of what you're doing. I says, but I can see what you're doing. I can give you maybe some creative design suggestions. I says, but do the research. I says, there is a, an infinite amount of information out here. And one of the things that, that I believe is the, the fundamental for our kids is having the encouragement to read, mm-hmm. getting them to read more, getting yep. To understand how significant reading is to opening their minds and their imagination so that they're able to even, you know, dream of doing something that doesn't exist. That's where that's where reading will take us. Yes. And and what's important here as well, there are programs do, through BEA where we have young people coming in. Middle school children are coming in with the whole program designed specifically for them. And they literally bus in, fly in students from all over the country to attend BEA. Okay, and I want to get a word in. Awesome. Do. Um, <laughs> we're talking about science, technology, engineering, and math. Did you know that the shoe lasting machine was created by Jan Madzeliger, the ironing board? was invented by Sarah Boone. Lubricators by Elijah McCoy, i.e. the real McCoy. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Horseshoe by Oscar Brown. The Elevator, Alexander Miles. The Pacemaker, Otis Boykin. Guided Missiles, no, that was, uh, the gas mask was Garrett Morgan. The Guided Missile is Otis Boykin. And the Traffic Signal, Garrett Morgan. Just to name a couple. Mm -hmm. Now, did you know, hold up, hold up. Did you know that an an invention could get you your freedom back during the days of American slavery? There were a lot of blacks that secured their freedom if they came up with an invention that became patented. And so that helps you to fathom how many inventions are already out here that black people made and created and invented that white people stole the patents to, in essence. But they'll say, we didn't steal it because there were no rules like that. Just like with Johns Hopkins and- um, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, he just sent me the book, uh, Ronnie Lacks. Henrietta Lacks's cells, the immortal cells that never died, self-rejuvenating. And Hopkins will say, well, there weren't any rules like that back then. Therefore, we don't know them anything right so i guess we're finished with bayo no oh no no Kevet, you've got to meet dr tyrone taborn yeah. she she you know in her introduction really we have to pay homage not just the scientists uh but also a businessman Yes. 35 years. Let me tell you something. I've been to the best black business networking events in this city, the best in this state, including Wayne Frazier's um, uh, Maryland, Washington Minority Companies Association annual breakfast. Huge. Sells out Martin's West. But nope. LeBron Finney, back when he was doing his uh, black business Black Entrepreneurship Weekend business stuff, uh, African American business stuff. It's LeBron, who's, who's roughly my age, has done incredible events, but nobody in this town tops Dr. Tyrone Tabor. It's really not, nobody. It's really not a, an event; it's an experience. Because there's an admiral right there. There's a general right there, and they all black. <laughs> And they're scientists and engineers and they're beautifully dressed and they have makeup on and they're elegant and they're brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a whole weekend with, there are all these different events. So they kick it off on Thursday with a reception in a normal environment. So they still do that as a gathering in the virtual world. But then they have a breakfast, an awards breakfast with amazing speakers and amazing people who have done incredible work. So that's on the Friday morning. Then there's workshops all throughout the day. Then there's an awards luncheon. Then there's workshops. 
What's the link, Marsha? Where do you want people to go? B E Y A B E Y A dot org. Where's my finger? It was okay. Dot org. Now listen, with that reverse screen. We'll plug this again at the end. Are we gonna work on your man white skills at the end of the show? We will, we will. But Marsha, Marsha, we're about to do something phenomenal on this show. What? But before we do it, and, and I do mean brief, um, bless us with prayer. Mm. Whew. Ooh, let me decrease, Lord, you in. Amen, me. amen, amen. Okay, was it, you, you were done? <laughs> I'll try it again. That's all it took. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this experience. And thank you for all this knowledge that we're going to partake in this show. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all right. With that said, yesterday, Colin, you are live. Mayor Colin Bird, <laughs> mayor of Greenbelt. Good morning. Tighten that time because, yeah, they're going to be watching you all over the country. Don't make me crazy. <laughs> I'm talking about politicians that don't know about the Windsor. Okay. Uh, first of all, yesterday, Marsha, woo, woo. Woo woo! What happened last night, Marsha? <laughs> Warnock, 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 Warnock. Stacey Warnock. Abrams was working it. She worked her behind off, and we are so proud. And Valencia's brother is now the first black senator right here, coming out of Georgia. Georgia. Okay. So, brother number one. So, brother number one. Attorney Bob. What happened? What happened? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, I apologize. I've been helping 45 making travel plans. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. I was a little tired up. I was a little tired up. Are you working on the eviction? Would yeah. you give him a missile? Take him out on a missile. I, I'm, I'm not at liberty to discuss the details. It's a matter of national security. <laughs> <laughs> Marcy got so excited she done fell off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Marsha, I'm here. I'm, here. I'm, here. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. Just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. I, you know, I've been up all night waiting for all the numbers. Lord have mercy. I'm so excited. I can't breathe. I'm breathing. Go ahead, y'all. Just carry on. Just carry on. Attorney, Attorney the Shield, how would you describe the sentiment right now in Black America, in America overall? Your thoughts. Wow. Well, first of all, I'm not going to presume to know the sentiments of, of all black folk, but I can tell you that for those that I believe are informed about what has been transpiring, particularly yesterday in Georgia, uh, I, I feel elated um, because the, 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 prime, the, the principle that I think it establishes, uh, that's been established in Georgia, is that we really can win, that we really can affect the outcome where we act in unison. We really can prevail where we respect one another and act together. Uh, and, and that's a principle that if, if, if you know, as Stacey Abrams said, any, anybody who makes a plan for the White House and doesn't stop in Georgia is doomed to fail. And she was right. She was right. The path to Washington had to pass through Atlanta. Right. And, and so and so I'm 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 elated and I believe that most black people who understand and are witnessing what is going on and what's transpired are equally so. Marcia? Yes. I'm just grateful. And we're we've been dealing with the madness and I don't even understand how some of those people can maintain their seat in the Senate <clears throat> in Congress when they are so diabolical about how this nation should be managed. And it was necessary for civility to come back. If you've got Carl Bernstein talking about the president of the United States literally trying to sabotage an election. There's something fundamentally wrong with him as a human being but there's something fundamentally wrong from a legal standpoint where people who have been voted into position are trying to 
take over and create a coup in this nation to take over this government. And it is enough. It is enough. When you have all these generals and leaders that have created the Lincoln Project to just work against this whole party and their behavior. And it's like a, a, a renegade sector of the Republican Party that is not, it's not safe. And they're dangerous. They are dangerous to you this. You know, Attorney DeShield, I was watching a movie over the weekend. Now, there's a new movie out about John Brown. Uh, you know, John Brown was a slave insurrectionist, abolitionist. He was right. he was deep in West Virginia with Harper's Ferry, Virginia insurrection right. raid took place. But I didn't know that John Brown was also one hell of a force in the state of Kansas. They had in Kansas these people called the Jayhawkers. Now, I always thought the Jayhawks was, was a basketball team. Right, right, right. But it came out of this notion of Kansas being a free state. What I didn't know is that white people in Kansas, there were some that were for slavery, but there was other, there were others like John Brown and his sons who fought adamantly against slavery. Now, not saying that the majority of the white people in Kansas wanted black people there. They just didn't like other white people telling them you had to own slaves. And what's interesting about Kansas is that it's right above Oklahoma. And of course, you all know that I've been working on a book on Black Wall Street there in Oklahoma. But these were unsettled territories, unsettled lands. And what's interesting is the fight between white people on, on over the topic of slavery. Is it much different today? Well, well, mm. be, 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 before and the answer to that is no. All right, let me be a, let me be a lawyer first and answer the question that was asked. The answer is no. But then I want to talk about something else. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, a few years ago, if you remember, uh, a, a, a friend of mine named Julius Henson was was tried for uh, in connection with a robocall incident. Uh, on behalf of the then governor. <clears throat> and the, specifically, he was charged with using robocalls to, uh, by, to make false representations to voters uh, to influence them and, and to, in this particular, in that particular case, it was to supposedly to influence them not to vote. The election was over, it was in the bag, everything was done, don't worry about it, go to sleep, enjoy yourself. The point I'm getting at is, um, we've got a political system now where those seeking office and in office can lie with impunity. Here we have here 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 was it, here was someone accused of of a federal crime for trying to influence how people voted by making false representations to them. That's what politics has come to generally. I, I I asked a friend of mine a few years ago to introduce a bill in the state legislature, and that bill I, I call it the Truth in Politics Act, <clears throat> and it would have made it illegal for any person seeking office or holding office to make, publish, or endorse a statement where the intent was to influence how somebody voted, and the statement was was knowingly false. Of course, the bill never got introduced, even by my friend. But the point, the point is, those seeking office and those holding office need to tell the truth. See, the first decision that most people make is who to trust. Mm -hmm. They make that decision before they ever hear what the person has to say. Right. That's why Donald Trump can be so successful. Because he convinced a large swath of this, this public to trust him, even though they hadn't heard or didn't know a thing about him. What they, knew, what they thought they knew about him was probably false. But he, he convinced them that he was the one to be trusted. And from that point on, every word he uttered, they took as gospel. And some of them, many of them, unfortunately, still do. But they understood or that he, he let them see that he was as racist as they are. And he was one of them. Okay, and well, now, now, they all race, now they all see where that racism has gotten them. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride and honor that I present to you the youngest sitting mayor, sitting black mayor in America, Mayor Colin Bird of Greenbelt, Maryland. Good morning, sir. Good morning to you, Brother Glover. Good, morning. good morning, everybody. Now, Mr. Bob, I've, heard, 
I first met Colin before he was mayor. He was a student at the University of Maryland, and he wrote some columns for this very publication, bemorenews.com. And those editorials, uh, guest editorials, because we became a big fan of his, uh, change, helped change the name one of Bird Stadium at the University of Maryland. And he also helped get the statue of Roger Tanney, your homeboy, I'm just joking, get Roger Tanney bumped from Annapolis. But now, today, he's going to announce something even greater. You ever heard of Stenny Hoyer? Yep. <laughs> you ever heard of Mike Miller? Yep. Well, in Maryland, we call them the good old boys. Oh, now, yeah. I know thought y'all y'all up north. <laughs> I, I know you think George is down south, but I'm here to tell you in the state of Maryland, it's not much different than Georgia. Well, anyway, without further ado, Mayor Colin Bird. Come on with it, Colin. Well, once again, thank you so much for having me on, Brother Glover. Uh, Mr. Donnie, and um, uh, always a pleasure to reconnect and uh, to uh, talk with you. Before I say anything, I, I want to go ahead and start out by shouting out Greenville, shouting out PG, shouting out Charles County, shouting out all the CD5, uh, and also shouting out DC. Uh, I always want to start out in this whole campaign. Every time I'm talking with the press, I want to talk about the fact that DC needs statehood because we can't begin a conversation about federal legislation without acknowledging and pointing out the injustice that is taxation without representation for many of our fellow Americans right next door in DC. So I want to start with that. But yeah, I'm I'm uh I'm 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 taking on the legacy of Senator Mike Miller uh, and I'm also taking on Steny Hoyer for Congress. Uh, and so I could tell you that the reason that I'm doing the latter uh, is because, um, you know, when I first became mayor, um, I um, had no idea that within just a few short months, we would be staring down uh, the barrel of two major issues. Uh, we're always facing issues, but two extraordinary issues. Uh, and that is a global pandemic, number one, and number two, unprecedented unrest around racial injustice, police brutality, and the criminal injustice system. I'm sorry, the criminal justice system, right? And so, um, you know, through the course of that whole experience, um, which is ongoing, I saw and was increasingly pained by um, the absence of leadership, the absence of good leadership from our Congressman uh, Steny Hoyer um, on issues that matter to us locally uh, and issues that matter to the people of America. America. So, for example, on the pandemic, the biggest issue that I had an objection to, to sum it up, is his mismanagement of the stimulus talks. So <laughs> as a member of House leadership, he is, he's been in the back room uh, with other individuals. And throughout the entire time, he has made some major missteps when it comes to our interests right here in Greenbelt. So, for example, on the stimulus, number one, uh, in the, in the CARES Act was passed uh, earlier in the summer of 2020, they left out over 99.9% .9 of the municipalities in America. They left out over 99.9% .9 of the municipalities in America. So small and medium-sized cities like Greenbelt were left out of the CARES Act. That's number one. Number two, uh, with respect to the um, stimulus talks, um, in this most recent stimulus talks, um, he did not fight initially for $2,000 stimulus checks or even $1,200 stimulus checks to the extent that I think he should have. Um, he waited until, and House leadership waited until Nancy Pelosi, I'm sorry, until Donald Trump called everybody out on the $600 stimulus checks um, and, and pushed for $2,000 stimulus checks. That is extraordinarily problematic to me um, that they would capitulate on that very important part of it. Um, and again, in this most recent round of stimulus talks, they also capitulated on state and local government funding and to this date still have not called for a separate vote on that matter, which hurts not only cities like Greenbelt, but also larger cities like Baltimore, uh, the state of Maryland uh, and other places uh, throughout the United States of America. So seeing that really pained me uh, and seeing that he was unwilling to address that nor meet with my city about that specific issue and other issues of interest to us really caused me great concern. But there are other issues like the racial injustice around a uh, police brutality that really concern me. 
he cannot even be an ally on this. He's not an ally on this. And he certainly is not a champion on this. In fact, Stanley Hoyer most notably helped create the national model for police unaccountability here in this country. What do I mean by that? He, when he was in the Maryland State Senate, he supported the first ever law enforcement officers bill of rights in all of America. And to this day, in all the decades since, civil rights advocates, police reform advocates have been trying to not only repeal that, but also make other police reform efforts that folks like Steny Hoyer and uh, Mike Miller have ob obstructed for decades. Um, and so he doesn't support the Breathe Act either. That is an important police reform measure being proposed at the federal level by folks like Ayanna Presley and the Movement for Black Lives. Uh, and beyond that, uh, he, um, he can't champion the issue and he's never been present. So you remember just five years ago when there was unrest uh, around the country and in Baltimore over the death of Freddie Gray, uh, Congress people like uh, Elijah Cummings actually came to Baltimore. They were in the heart of Baltimore. Throughout all of these conversations and ever since I've been on the city council first and um, you know serving as mayor, uh, Steny Hoyer has been absent without leave. He has never been present in the community on any of these conversations. And that oh, absolutely- In absolutely. Prince George's Prince County? In Prince George's County. Oh, in Prince George's man, County. You, you running in the fifth. That's- I'm running the fifth, the fifth district. Mostly Prince George's, a part of uh, Charles County. You got some Charles, you got some St. Mary's, you got some Calvert. You got some Anna running. Yeah. Isn't your majority black? Uh, in a Democratic primary, a large sector of the electorate is definitely African American. And and, and, but but Donnie, Donnie, too, I'm going to ask the mayor if he knows with respect to that crime legislation that you talked about, story, I mean, for the police, so called police accountability and protection. I, I suspect that the majority of the black members of the legislature also supported that bill. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I think if you look, you'll find that's true because typically we follow the leader. But also, let me say that Prince George's County has a long history of electing uh, 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 at least one or two black mayors. I remember, I think it was Hank Harrington years ago was elected as the mayor of Glen Arden. I think it was. Uh, so I applaud the fact that you that you are in the position you are in. I agree with everything you've said about Stanley Hoyer, but I want to know about... Putting if Stanley Hoyer or nobody else was in the race, why why should we support you? Tell me about you. Yeah, that's a great question. So as uh, Mr. Glover said, look, I want you to I, I can tell you I can you know tick off a list of accomplishments, but what I want you to understand is fundamentally my character mm -hmm. and the way I approach politics because that difference is what matters when we're talking about me and Stanley Hoyer because right. uh, politics is about you know a choice of between alternatives. So understand that. Um, I think the biggest way to understand the difference between me and Stanley Hoyer is to understand the difference between our human heroes. OK, so his hero, if you ever hear him talk about how he first got interested in politics, um, he will always tell you that his hero is John F. Kennedy. Uh, we both are, are, are Terps, uh, Stanley Hoyer and I. But he went in an era where you didn't even have African-Americans on the football team, for example. So it was a long, long time ago. But when he was at Maryland, John F. Kennedy visited Maryland, gave a speech, and thereafter, Steny Hoyer became that much more interested in politics, and he decided to ultimately dedicate his life to that. He spent over 60 plus years uh, in, in politics, electoral politics ever since then. But I'll say this. What I understand fundamentally uh, about John F. Kennedy uh, is that while there are some good things that we can say about John F. Kennedy, most notably as black people, the fact that he supported the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when in 1963, uh, he made that statement that he was in, in favor of it. I understand fundamentally that he only did that because we pushed him. Let me say that again. He only did that because we pushed him. The difference between me and Steny Hoyer is that he's about good old boys politics. I'm about good trouble. John F. Kennedy only did that because we pushed them. And in pushing him, we did say, and John Lewis specifically said at the March on Washington in 1963, that that bill needed to do more. He prophetically said specifically that that bill needed to address police brutality, for example. And right now we are seeing the consequences of that bill neglecting to address that important issue as it was important then and as it is important now. And so what I understand and what I believe we need in Congress is somebody who 
um, sees power the way that I see it. I believe, based on my own experiences and observations of Steny Hoyer, that Steny Hoyer thinks that um, if you have power, you should sit on it for the people who already have power. No question is asked. The way I see power is that if you have power, you should do something good with it for the people without it, without being begged, without being begged. And that is the difference over and over and over, whether it's police brutality, whether it's racial injustice, whether it's the criminal justice system, whether it's the stimulus, whether it's the coronavirus pandemic in general, we've seen that Steny Hoyer takes forever to do the right thing. And that's if he ever does do the right thing in the first place. And so that is the difference. Um, my politics was not born out of raw ambition or even admiration for a specific uh, politician. To be honest with you, uh, my politics was birthed out of activism, in particular, out of the Black Lives Matter movement. The reason I got into this in the first place started with activism. It started with my concerns about the a killing of Trayvon Martin in particular, because I related to him as a young black man to be very candid. And everything that ever happened since then in terms of me building multicultural coalitions at the University of Maryland, not only on the stadium name issue, which a lot of people know about, but on a number of other substantive issues uh, on the campus and beyond. And so I've always tried to govern or approach government in a sense that it has to serve people and it has to be responsive to the needs of the people without forcing the people to beg people in power to do the right thing. And so that that understanding that and understanding that, you know, I really believe all politics is local and that you have to be in the community and serve the community. It, it forms the basis for everything that else that I've done and that I try to do. I support Medicare for all. I support a Green New Deal. I support paying college athletes. I believe earlier in the conversation, you guys were talking about how we're, you know, in the middle of the college football playoff championships, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, um, you know, we need to be having a conversation about how over a four year period, uh, we have scores of black families, scores of black families sending their kids to these schools to make the schools millions of dollars, even in a global pandemic, by the way. And yet they're being robbed of billions of dollars in generational wealth over that four year period. This is right here in Maryland right here in my county at University of Maryland College Park and all across the country. It does not affect everybody, but that injustice should pain and uh, concern uh, everybody uh, in all of this Mayor country. Bird, Mayor Bird, question. Isn't that because we raise our children to go to those schools? Right. Isn't that, isn't that because we encourage our children to go to University of Maryland and not Morgan or University of Maryland and not Lincoln or Cheney or Morehouse or Tuskegee? Is, don't we have the first opportunity from the time of birth and we start changing the diapers to yeah. raise them Or is it that they get more money and get the funding that they need to go to school? But that's because that's a chicken or egg. They have the money because we made it for them. So, so we're talking about two separate issues here, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about whether, whether uh, these young people should go to an HBCU uh, on one hand or, or PWI. And on the other hand, whether a school that is making that is profiting off of whether it's football, basketball, or some other support should be paying those individuals that provide the labor for that endeavor for those profits. Those are two separate questions, right? Um, I believe that if profits are generated anywhere in this country, the labor force that's behind those profits should be paid, right? Whether that's at an HBCU, a PWI, or anywhere else in or outside of sports. All I'm saying is that this is the only industry and this is the only subset of an industry where you have a modern form of slavery hidden in plain sight on literal fields. Yeah. Fields. Yeah. And on courts. Courts without justice. Courts mm -hmm. without justice. That's the issue. Now you raised a separate very important point about HBCUs. Ask Kevin. Ask Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> and you know, the interesting thing, my name is uh, Colin, uh, Colin Kaepernick. That's another issue that you see at these PWIs and, and, in, and in sports in general. Both what's, in what's that acronym you're using? What TWI? PWIs, predominantly white institutions. TWI is another tra tra traditionally white institution. I'm just talking about white schools. UMD versus Okay, like, you, know, you, got, you, got, you, got, you got to give it to me straight. No chaser. No, okay. I got you. All right, so 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 we can call it no, white schools. No, no acronym. It's white schools, schools and right. black schools because I don't believe that that I, when other people use historical, the paper writer on this panel will tell you. I think that means something that used to be and will not be in the future. So let's be careful okay. with that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Getting wound right. up now. 
Wow. So notwithstanding that, we need to do more to support our HBCUs. So another key component of my platform is to invest more in HBCUs. But, you know, everybody says let's invest more in HBCUs. I'm very specific about some goals that I think need to be taking place with HBCUs here in America. Right. We have and I want to make sure I had the numbers correct. But, um, you know, I come from, you know, Prince George's County is the wealthiest black county and majority black county in all of America. And so some of the problems that we face aren't just class based. They're class and race based, their intersectionality. And so we still have bad health care in some ways. Right. We, we are the diabetes capital of America. We still have, for example, schools that are underperforming and we still have under underfunded HBCU in the case of uh, Bowie State. So what do I want to do with HBCUs that's different than what people have been talking about? I believe I believe that we need to invest in more HBCUs having law schools and med medical schools. OK, public HBCUs having law schools and medical schools. Why do I say that in America right now? You have 204 law schools in America. Only six of those law schools are HBCUs. That means if you're a young black person and you want to ultimately become a lawyer and you want to be trained at an HBCU, you have very, very, very limited options, very limited options to go to an HBCU. There's no HBCU law school uh, in all of Maryland. There's no HBCU medical school in all of Maryland. With medical schools, you have 155 medical schools in America. Only four of those schools are HBCUs. We need to invest in more HBCU medical schools. Look, the two biggest issues in America right now literally dovetail with this, right? On one hand, you have a coronavirus pandemic and massive healthcare disparities that are being underscored by that pandemic and its effect, right? We have a un we have a shortage of doctors. And we have inequalities in healthcare. I could tell you this: if you want to get the vaccine, or if you wanted to to be um, in the vaccine trial experiments, I remember that the University of Maryland, Baltimore, was running those experiments. There was no HBCU that you could go to to go through in any of those experiments uh, and to get vaccines and to get connected to vaccines. And you know, we can have a whole conversation about trust in vaccines, right? I believe that if we were the ones producing that vaccine, that would increase that much more trust. But you remember, there's reasons in America for folks to have trust of uh, medical care provided by folks outside of the black community. I'm not yeah, saying yeah. that I subscribe to that, but a lot of us have a, a legitimate yeah, reason. Yeah, to be Mayor, Mayor Bird, Mayor Bird, I, I just have a question, and and I and thank you because that's a, a national view that we all need to really pay attention to. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Stinney's been around a long time. 39 and, years. And in, in those 39 years, he has created these camps across this state. Whatever it is that you are doing in terms of your platform, your, your uh, stump speech, you have to turn over all of those people who have been voting for Stinney for 39 years. I think that speaks to something that Mr. Bob has alluded to in the past, that black people can be white supremacists too. And so what we have to think about is how, how do you energize that base and flip that base to do what you need to do for the win? Look, for um, the win. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm all about winning. I'm, I'm look. My goal in this campaign, as 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 crazy as it may sound to some people, is to beat him by 20 plus points. Let me say that again: to beat him by 20 plus points. I'm very specific about my goal, and I'm dedicated to that goal. Now, the question can, that you have: How do we get to that? Can you be? Now, can, can, can you be? Uh, let me. Let me. Uh, I hate to say. I need you to be more specific. For example, uh, let I, me go back. I, 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 I was about to go. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Do your thing. Let, let me. Let me. First. First. <laughs> You know, I, I think first, going back to your earlier comment, I couldn't agree with you more about the professional schools. I, I made, that, made that same comment. I think there are only five black law schools, but the real problem is of those five, the, the, the student population in two of them is 50 percent, near 50 percent non-black. So so it's not so. So so the question is not so much where you go it's it's what you're taught when you get there and who's doing it and who's teaching you and for what purpose. But let me let me let me let me go. I, what I want to know is. It, but do you believe when you say we've got to invest more in these schools, who is the we you talking about? OK. 
and where is the money coming from? I think you got to be specific. You can't. I don't. Okay, you know, he was getting ready to be specific. All right, so 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 no no. I'm, so y'all are asking two, y'all are asking two different questions. If right. you don't mind, can I take them in turn? Is that yeah. okay with you guys? Okay. So uh, your question was about how how we win, uh, Miss Marsha, Miss uh, Miss Juice. Uh, so so the way we win is is through the heart and soul of Prince George, uh, through the whole heart and soul of CD five. If I blow him out in Prince George's County, which I will, and I blow him out in Charles County, that's the end of the story for him. It's game over. Now, how do we take people who have always voted for Stenny, uh, right. almost almost without reservation, and and change that? Well, the reality is what we do is what I've always done, and that is wake people up. And if people wake up, and when I say wake up, let me be precise what I mean by that. It's about raising awareness of the issues and raising awareness of how he is bad for the issues that matter to us. I don't believe that anybody has effectively made that case. And I believe that I have tried cases in the past, smaller cases that give me the foundation, the groundwork to show that I am in a position to actually make a case of this magnitude. You know, before you got to understand that, again, coming to my heroes, I'm a student of history. And so understand that, you know, while I'm not a lawyer, I'm very much inspired by folks like Thurgood Marshall. And, you know, before he ever won the case of Brown versus Board of Education, he won several smaller fights, starting at the University of Maryland, starting at College Park, starting at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. He desegregated College Park. He desegregated the schools in Baltimore, the nursing school, the medical school, the law school. He desegregated these schools surgically and over time throughout the country in small fights. And then he won the big fight in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Throughout my entire time as an activist, I haven't just made points. I've scored points and I've won small battles on issues that not everybody's even thinking about. Some big, some well, tell, us about, tell us about Bird Stadium. Why was that important to you as a University of Maryland student getting the name changed? Why? So, so that's a great example, right? So, for example, and I know that folks will say this is different, but this is what this is this is what it comes down to. You have an individual who the university decided to whitewash his legacy and say that this guy was great. Now, that's not to say that I'm here to say everybody who's white in the past is not great. I'm not here to make those type of categorizations. We can have those debates. That's not what my point is. But I knew how to and I delivered on making the case that what was being purported about this individual was completely out of proportion with reality. And so let's talk about Curly. what I did with Curly Bird. Um, who was the namesake of the stadium? Because that gives you a window into the way I look at this. It, Curly, the facts of Curly Bird didn't change when I got involved in the issue, and when the when when I raised the stadium name issue, it was not the first time that anybody had raised that issue. People had been advocating for decades to try to get this done, but nobody had successfully made the case. How did I do it? Well, first of all, I do my homework, right? Uh, I do my research, but I also am an effective communicator. So the, the people didn't know, frankly, that he was a racist. Um, they didn't know that he was a segregationist. There's things that people don't understand about Steve Hoyer that, as I explain it to him, it's going to make folks wake up. And as folks wake up, they will rise up. We can get into some of the details, but that is the key because, you know, they, they so I, I laid out how not only was Curly Bird a segregationist, but he was a very unique and notable segregationist, for example. So he not only was just this another segregationist, but he was the guy who literally set Thurgood Marshall on fire. He was the guy that denied Thurgood Marshall. And for decades, for decades since then, fought Thurgood tooth and nail on segregation, losing court case after court case. And then ultimately, listen to what I'm saying. Listen, to what I, I see you, Mr. I, Robert. I, I hear what you're saying, but listen, I, listen I, what I'm saying. I, I, let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Go ahead. And even after he retired as president of the university, he ran for governor against governor uh, against Theodore <laughs> McGill, who was a champion of civil rights. And he lost on a segregationist platform. Another aspect of Curly Bird's legacy that people didn't even understand is that stadium was named after him supposedly because he was, um, you know, somebody that helped build the athletic program and the football program in particular. But one of the things that I shared with people is that he was bad on that. Number one, because. Everybody knows that if you don't recruit African-Americans, that's bad, number one. But beyond that, consider this. 
the one of the best football coaches in all of college football history is considered an individual that used to coach at Alabama by the name of Bear Bryant. Do you know that before he got to Alabama, he coached at Maryland? And when he coached at Maryland, he was a good coach and Curly Bird ran him out of town. How do we celebrate? That's 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 actually, man, man, you know, man, not what I, I got to ask you something, please. I, I, I do apologize. And I'm going to get yeah, off the but I was going to ask you a question about HBCUs and the funding. For well, no, no, I'm going to ask you. I want to ask you one. I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to ask you whether you, whether you agree or disagree with it. it Brown v. Board of Education was the absolute worst case that ever has been for black people. That's my statement. What's your reaction? Well, I disagree. And that's your right to have that opinion. Um, and I understand why you have that opinion. Frankly, tell, let's tell, tell me why you think I have that opinion or, or you want me to tell you. So why don't you tell us? Why don't you tell us so we don't It was, it was the you worst don't. decision, in my opinion, in my opinion, it was the worst decision for black people because it established as a matter of law that any institution, educational or otherwise, that was predominantly black was necessarily inferior to any similarly situated white institution. That's what Brown v. Board of it, it established a permanent class intellectually and in every facet of our, it established that black folk legally were inferior, period, as a matter of law. That's what Brown said. That's what started this. When when I got, when, when segregation or so-called integration came to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, right? When the but when they started bringing the buses in, white kids didn't get to be, didn't get bus to black schools. I got busted. It my 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 brothers and sisters were bus to their schools, not because our schools were bad. Not we got taken from a place where I, where the teachers cared about us. We got taken from a place where the teachers lived with us. We got taken from a place where the teachers went to church with us and the grocery store with us. And my brothers and sisters got sent across town on buses to white schools with no black teachers, where nobody cared about them. And they were expelled and suspended at rates double that of every other kid in the school. That's what Brown and B Board of Education did for us. And, so, and how how does that impact? And, and I'm sorry, I hear you. And we have to look at our history to see our future and our present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, this is really, if you're talking about going up against Stenny, this is really war. And you need five things that you need to be able to do to flip all those voters. And I don't know what those numbers are. I don't know exactly where they are and how the, he's been doing it for 39 years. How do you go in and do a total flip of that seat? So you've never had a, a black mayor uh, from the heart and soul of the district run against Steny Hoyer. Understand that Steny Hoyer lives in St. Mary's County. That is a that is a liability for him. He doesn't even he doesn't even have ties to the heart and soul of the district. That is extraordinarily important. And that is going to be something that resonates with people in Prince George's County that are facing certain issues. I talked about the stimulus, but also there are several other local issues that are going to resonate with people in Prince George's County. Stanley Hoyer does not oppose the MAGA. He's got name I mean, recognition. He's got name recognition. Yeah, he has name recognition. State vote. Get the lever. He has name He's recognition. He's 80 years old. And I'm telling you, Colin is going to snatch him. Whether it's Look. this time or the next time, Colin is going to knock off Stenny. You've heard it right here on Be More News, the news before the news, where we uncover the truth. The truth. When is that election? When is that election? That's a, that election is in June of 2022. And all I can tell you is name recognition won't save him. Okay. It will not save him. People who have had name recognition have lost before and they will lose again. Because it's not just your name, it's also what people understand about your name. What does his name represent? In the end, what people are going to understand is his name represents good old boys politics. And in this county, well, that's not what we want. But we also have to be shown that there's a viable alternative. And that is going to be what I do. Now, I just want to quickly address two other things that just came up. One, you mentioned Brown versus Board of Education. I'm not here to debate all of the nuances of it. But I interpret the decision in Brown versus Board of Education differently. Very precisely, Brown versus Board of Education, the ruling in that decision was that a segregation in public schools was a violation of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which provided for equal protection of the laws. Everything else is commentary and editorializing, but that is the specific holding in that particular case. Now, another question was asked by you earlier 
about where does the money hold come on, from? Hold on, hold on. I'm not going to. I am a lawyer. I've been doing it for 47 years, and I'm not going to let you get away that easily. Brown, <laughs> Brown went a lot farther than that. Brown said, I understand. Brown, Brown said, how do we end segregation? And we end segregation not by equally funding black schools, which could have been an alternative. We end segregation by sending black kids to sit in a building with white kids because that's going to make that's going to that's going to expose them and make them access and, 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 and give them access to the same resources as white kids, except for one thing. They go to we were sending places where nobody wants to be. We send them in places where they are treated as human beings. We are, we're sending them to places where they don't have the expectation that they can achieve and become mayor of, of, uh, of uh, as you have become. That's what we did in Brown. We, we took away the legacy to give to our children that says our institutions are important, that need to be preserved, and they need to be nurtured. That's so what Brown that. said. So you actually Brown lived versus Brown Board of versus Education. Brown, didn't you? You actually lived Brown versus Brown. Is that right? I, I I not only lived it, I saw it coming. I was there I when it was decided. I understand, and but that, I just, Danny, I guess, that's how that's how Brown got to be Brown. Your, John Brown, that's how Brown got to be in Kansas. By the way, Brown v. Board, Board of Education was a Kansas case. Go ahead. I'm look, sorry. I'm not I'm not at all questioning uh, your your legal uh, acumen. All I'm saying is that I believe very candidly that what needs to be focused on is that while Brown versus Board of Education may have had some comments with which I disagree. I believe that what I said about the holding is accurate. And beyond that, I also believe that Brown versus Board of Education did not rule HBCUs unconstitutional as is being implied. So let me just let me just put it like that. HBCUs can continue to exist under the holding in Brown and they continue. They do. Now, there are other issues that need to address vis-a-vis HBC need to be addressed vis-a-vis HBCU. But that's my view there. Now, you ask, where does the money come from in terms of who supports the HBCUs? I mean, obviously, everybody should be supporting HBCUs. But what I'm talking about in respect to what I'm doing is that the federal government needs to invest more money in HBCUs. We can't keep having all of these spending bills that keep underfunding HBCUs. There needs to be federal investment in HBCUs. And you say what folks are being taught at HBCUs. Here's where I think we might agree, maybe not, um, that we need to have, you know, HBCUs to teach folks uh, the law as well, because at HBCUs is where you're going to have people like Charles Hamilton Houston, for example, the dean of Howard University's law school who taught uh, Thurgood Marshall to teach lawyers to not just be lawyers and practice law, but to be social engineers who help change society for the better. That's my let's, personal let's, view. Let's, 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 shift, let's shift gears a bit. Colin, tell me about Georgia last <laughs> night. What Warnock and Ostoff's uh, victories mean to you? Um, so, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot being said about um, those victories. And I want to just uh, focus on Reverend Warnock. Obviously, it's good news on many fronts. Um, I want to focus on Reverend Warnock. A lot of folks are talking about him being the first black Democrat elected to the U.S. Senate from the South. Um, a lot of folks are happy that it looks like stimulus checks, $2,000 stimulus checks are more likely to be coming. Uh, in the mail or in direct deposit in the bank accounts. But what struck me most um, and touched me most about the election of Reverend Warnock in particular is that he is the first uh, black person that I'm aware of in my lifetime to be elected to the U.S. Senate while standing, relatively speaking, uh, for the truths that Reverend Jeremiah Wright espoused in his quote unquote, controversial 2008 sermon that led Barack Obama to disavow his association with Reverend Wright. You remember Reverend Wright uh, had some things to say about America that America did not want to hear. But in fact, these things were truths about America, about racial injustice, about slavery, about segregation, about uh, America's uh, foreign policy, uh, about America's handling of uh, segregation in in the military, in higher education, uh, and injustice all across the board. And what troubled me then was that the politics of 2008's presidential election seemed to dictate that in order for the president, for, Don, for, for Barack Obama to be elected president, he would have to disavow himself with Reverend Wright in spite of those truths, in spite of those being truths. And what Reverend Warnock did then and continued to do since then is say, no, what Reverend Wright said was the truth, because I believe this about America. 
America is blessed in some ways. God does bless America. God does bless. God provides grace. But I also believe that God provides judgment. And with all of America's misdeeds against people here in America and abroad, America has to understand fundamentally that God uh, does not provide, God is not a politician. He does not provide special exemptions for the often wealthy, powerful, and selfish special interest lobbyist that is the United States of America as it pleads for blessings. America will be blessed by God, but America has to also understand that as it provides injustice and enacts injustice on us as a people, uh, America invites and rolls out a welcome mat for judgment. Calm is real. You can't accept that truth. COVID-19. COVID-19. You know, and, I, and again, I'm not going to draw that line because that's a that my favorite. But yep. what I'm saying is we know that. <laughs> let me tell you this about politics. If you want to know what pains me most about politics, we can get into all of the specific issues. But what pains me most about American politics is what I saw in 2008 with Reverend White. And that is this. America, in American politics, we have a situation where speaking the truth about injustice is a political liability. Speaking the truth about injustice is a political liability. And as long as that continues to be a political liability rather than a political strength, we are living in a country that is never going to see and realize its full potential. Our full potential will be realized when you can tell the truth and be rewarded for it in Who's politics true? and outside of politics. Whose truth is true? Whose truth is true? People yes. don't want the truth. Avoid Look, that. that. That's the truth. That's true. the setup. Presidential election <laughs> certification. Tell me about it, Colin Burke. You have some thoughts on presidential uh, certification of the election. I was, born, I was born in the year of Rodney King in 1992. And... When so 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 that was a presidential election year. 1996 was a presidential election year, but I was too young at that time to really comprehend anything that was going on. The first presidential election that I ever sort of knew a little bit about what was going on, not a whole lot, was the 2000 presidential election. I was eight years old and I saw my parents pained by what they were seeing with that presidential election and the controversial manner in which George W. Bush ultimately ended up as president. I didn't say elected as president. I said ended up as president. I believe ever since that moment uh, that there is a real crisis in America's democracy that is prolonged for a long time uh, and has been long simmering based on many issues, including disenfranchisement of felons, disenfranchisement of people in prison who should not be in prison in the first place, the war on drugs. But in particular, in particular, what strikes me most is the injustice that is the electoral college. Right. I support abolishing the electoral college. We shouldn't even be talking about certification today. This election is over and it should be over. And yet today you have members of Congress that think that it's not over and they think that they can change what the American people have already decided. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, we still have this thing where every election you have presidential candidates who think they only have to campaign in a few states because of, quote unquote, swing state politics. All of America should be on the ballot. And all of America should matter in these elections. And then the last thing I'll come back to is a big threat to democracy is the fact yes. that we have D.C. Yes. not having U.S. senators. Yes, at all. That's why we're not getting $2,000 stimulus checks because Ridiculous. we continue to um, have a situation where U.S. the U.S. Senate lacks representatives that are supposed to be there. You know those would be Democrats, right? But they don't want because it. Because it's a city. They don't right. want them to have power. That's what, what, what do you think, think about open primaries out of control? What do you think about open primaries? You know, as somebody who was a Bernie delegate in 2016, this is something that I'm very familiar with as an open uh, controversy. Um, I, I personally support open primaries. I, I believe that, you know, folks should be able to weigh in. I, to be honest with you, when I first um, was registered to vote, I actually registered as an independent. Uh it wasn't until I couldn't I realized that I couldn't vote in a, pr a primary that I said, you know what, actually, I'm going to register as a Democrat to make sure that I can. And I registered as an independent because I didn't agree with a lot of things Republicans were saying and a lot of things Democrats were saying. Mm -hmm. But I realized the practicality said you need to register as a right. Democrat. 
kind of reality. And I'll say this. I'll say this to all of the folks that are in the Bernie crowd that think that this should be open primaries. The presidency is going to be very difficult for progressives to obtain as long as they think that the Democratic Party is their biggest enemy. Uh, is their biggest enemy. And as long as you have progressives who refuse to have any association with the Democratic Party and who will go into a general election and say, I don't care who's on the ballot, I'm not voting for a quote unquote Democrat that I don't like, you're going to always have a problem getting out of a primary where you know black folks, many black folks, not all black folks, but a lot of older black folks don't got time for none of that talk talking about, oh, I'm not going to support Hillary Clinton. Oh, I'm not going to support Joe Biden. So I'm careful when we get into these conversations about open primaries, because from a practical standpoint, I believe that, it, you know, we've got to pick a side um, practically. Well, 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 well isn't, isn't the problem that we only get two sides to pick from? Isn't right. the problem, isn't the, pro, isn't the two party system and closed primary <laughs> that feed into the electoral process? Isn't it all part of the same problem? But we don't have enough independence for it to even be equitable. But, but, it, but it wouldn't matter. It's a waste it would, of time. It wouldn't it's matter because, because, because it's the closed primaries that create the so-called swing states. And it's a no, swing state that feed into the electoral process. It's uh, all it, part of the same problem. It seems like the closed primaries are designed to protect white power. Yes. Speaking of which, Mayor Byrd, you are not only challenging Steny Hoyer. The machine. You have some thoughts about Thomas V. Mike Miller. And it, it's <laughs> been brought to my attention that Thomas V. Mike Miller, the former Senate president here in the state of Maryland, and Steny Hoyer represent a sort of Cosa Nostra. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Look, these are these are folks that are cut from the same cloth. Again, these are folks who represent good old boys politics and they represent the worst of, of politics here in America, uh, here in America and here in Maryland in particular and, and, and even beyond that in Prince George's County. They try to control Prince George's County politics. They operate as modern day slave masters who 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 succeed. This is how they succeed in the black community by by engaging in, in skillful tokenism, right? Skillful tokenism. While you have a handful of African American leaders and polit politicians who they basically have under their thumbs. And that's the only reason that they're able to survive through all of the bad things that they do to our community as a whole through public policy and um, negligence. Now, you asked me about Senator Mike Miller. Let me just say this about Senator Miller. I am calling for. And I am working with uh, a, a, a very diverse coalition uh, of lovers of justice to call for, and we will get this done, by the way, to call for Mike Miller's name to be removed from both the state Senate building and the University of Maryland administration building. Mike Miller, Senator Mike Miller, was and is a scourge to propriety and a minister society. Senator Mike Miller on, did not serve us as black people, no, he, he did not. He, he did not intimidated serve black politicians. That's what he did, especially in Prince George's County. He's a damn bully. That's a fact. He did not serve the people of Prince George's County. He only really served corporate interests, anti-black interests, anti-labor interests, anti-immigrant interests, and anti-civil rights interests. Look, he called Baltimore a ghetto piece of, and I don't know what I can say on this show, right? He called Baltimore a ghetto piece of S word. Number one. Number two, he led, he led racist redistricting efforts, not in 1960, not in 1950, not in 1970, not in 1980, not in 1990. He led racist redistricting efforts in the 21st century. Yeah. And after and while that case, and after that, th those lines, those, those lines were challenged by our first black county executive, Wayne Curry, in the courts. Uh, while that was happening, Senator Miller called, he broke uh, general assembly ethics and um, attorney ethics by calling and yelling at judges who would not uphold his racist redistricting plans. That's no so, different than Donald Trump. That's no different than Donald Trump. In fact, it's worse than Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell, because while they've engaged in a lot of undemocratic things, none of them have actually redrawn the lines of the boundaries of the United States of America right. or the boundaries of the state of Kentucky 
to ensure their reelection and to dilute black power. The whole purpose of him redrawing the lines in the way that he did was to dilute black power in his district so that he could be reelected. Reelected. Let me say something to you on that note, Mayor Byrd. Not only that, it was Thomas V. Mike Miller and uh, former Governor Martin O'Malley who did not support Kwaesiem Fume in 2006 when he ran for U.S. Senate. So while this is a two to one democratic state, we have never had a black U.S. Senate. Uh, that's that's a fact. That's a fact. And um, and, and you know, that's what it, that's what their their commitment to white supremacy was all about. You know, now, honestly, you know, Senator Cardin is, is in office right now. I have to make sure that I advocate with him. And so I'm not going to get too much into Senator Cardin right now. I believe he's going to be retiring on his own fairly and soon. And will be passing that seat on? I don't want you to ask that per se, but I tell you this, uh, Mr. Bob DeShield, I bet you Ben Cardin does not have one black person in mind to pass the ball to. <laughs> Maybe it'll be Jerome Stevens. Right, Maybe right, right. They're going to pass it to the Sarbanes kid. Right. But let me also say this about Senator Miller and, and maybe, maybe maybe Mr. Desheer will appreciate this. For decades, for decades, Senator Miller oversaw, presided over a state Senate that um, massively, massively underfunded Maryland's HBCUs and massively discriminated against Maryland's HBCUs to the tune of leading to, let me finish, to the tune of leading to Why the you worst. You saw me opening my mouth? I saw you. I saw, <laughs> hey, I see you. You like me, you get it cracking. I like it. <laughs> to the most infamous, largest HBCU lawsuit settlement in all of Maryland history. And this year, uh, while he had time to vote for gambling bills, uh, sport, sports betting bills, and horse racing bills, he did not have time to support the speaker's HBCU lawsuit settlement bill. OK, Senator Miller has always been more about gambling bills than he has been about our HBCUs. Remember, there was the FBI that actually had investigated him for his ties to the horse racing industry back in the day. See, this is what I mean by wake up, rise up. People don't notice when we expose this. This is how we create change. And then the last thing that I'll mention is that for decades, Senator Miller and folks like Steny Hoyer, but mostly Senator Miller, Miller has cultivated an image within our county as a modern day slave master who abused his power over legislation, over committees, over campaign slates, over what could come to the Senate floor, just like Mitch McConnell, to make it so that he controls and undermines Prince George County politics and progressive politicians all across the state. And so he's you know, gone now, right? He's yeah. gone now, but he's his gone. legacy is alive and I, we have I, to say- I understand who, that. Here, so who, who is the speaker now? Adrian Jones. The speaker is Adrian Jones, but the Senate president is Bill Ferguson from Baltimore. And yeah. he needs and to- so, and and the say, You know, I, I, Mayor, I don't disagree with the thing that you said about, about Steny or about Mike, both of whom I knew before you were born. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but, I, but, but, I, but just like charity, accountability begins at home. That's my okay. whole point. Our problem first, uh, the first problem that we need to solve is the problem among our people, our own mm -hmm. people. Okay, our own people. We've got to we've got to challenge every word because words words have power. And we got to we got to look behind the veil and get down to the basics. Yes, we could get when you say the federal government, the federal money is going to come from the federal government. Governments they can print money, but they don't earn it. So you got to tell me specifically what budget item is going to fund that? Who's going to who's going to whose taxes are going to pay that? Because the because on the other side of the coin, greed is the primary ingredient, is the core component of this economy as we know it in this country. That's why more black doctors are educated in Cuba than they are in all of America. Okay, I thank That's you for that. So 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 you. When I ask you to be specific, not because I don't, not because I disagree with you, but because I don't want. And you're well. You, you're obviously are committed. I believe what you say, but. We've got to get down to some very specific and be, we've got to tend to our own problems at home. Right. And our problem at home is we don't believe in ourselves. We don't believe in each other. We don't believe that we really have value. So we keep shifting the discussion to what white folk think about us. Let's so, deal with what we think about each other. So so understand that I believe that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. 
These are two separate issues that I think we both can address. And they are That's very important because you that, know what? That, a lot is, of that is the problem. That is that is the problem that sent our black folks to Vietnam to, to say that we'll deal with your issue when you get back. That's when we when not when, when my brothers and sisters, the 129 that graduated from high school with me, most of whom got killed in Nam. When they said deal with social injustice now, when they say deal with civil rights, they said that's that's two separate issues. We'll deal with that when you get back. Well, they didn't get back. That's a great I, I segue. Know. That's a great segue. Slow, slow down, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Right. Mr. Mayor, I uh, want to address it. Though. Go ahead, continue. That. Sorry. In your area, in Prince George's County in Southern Maryland, uh, my understanding is that you have tens of thousands of veterans. What? is your agenda when it comes to the veterans of your area and has uh you know steny Hoyer been representative of those veterans many of whom as you well know are black look i don't believe that congressman hoyer has held the veterans administration accountable for its massive uh under under servicing of our veterans uh you know everybody knows the va is is horrible and honestly, I believe that, um, frankly, and, and, and that's not to say that the people in the VA are horrible, but that that agency is underperforming. And I don't believe that Congress and people like Steny Hoya in Congress have have applied enough pressure to solve this problem uh, and really committed to putting the money behind supporting our veterans that is necessary to solve this, as well as the oversight that is necessary to help address this issue. Uh, number one. Number two, just on a symbolic note, I always think the symbolism is important, but I think the substance substance starts first. So I wanted to start with the VA and then underinvestment and benefits for our military folks, our veterans, that type of thing. But on a symbolic level, what's very concerning to me is this week you have presidential and, and next week you have presidential medals of a freedom going to people who are wholly undeserving of the highest civilian honor in the land. Uh, whoa, Jim, whoa, whoa, Jim, Mr. Mayor, tell me more. So you got Jim Jordan uh, and Devin Nunes, Congressman Jim Jordan and Congressman Devin Nunes. These are individuals, as you guys may know, whose only claim to fame or infamy, shall I say, was defending the president as it became clear that um, he was elected in 2016 largely with the support of Russia uh, and that there was some uh, engagement on the part of some of his emissaries to to make sure that that was what took place, number one. And number two, they also uh, have a claim to infamy for helping to defend the president as he was being impeached uh, for soliciting the help of Ukraine yep. uh, for, um, you know, in the 2020 presidential election. And even to this day, I'll tell you that I personally think as as impractical as it may seem, that he is worthy of another impeachment for what he tried to do in Georgia with the secretary of state in Georgia. These attacks and assaults on American democracy are try, try. extraordinary. They are unforgivable. And if we normalize them, we threaten our democracy that much more, which is an already fragile democracy. So while all of that is happening with these medals of freedom for these folks, guess who's not getting uh, awarded or uh, honored for tremendous uh, sacrifices and for tremendous uh, oh, contributions oh. to America. And that is a group of uh, black women veterans by the name uh, of the six triple eight, the six triple eight who were involved in the postal service during world war two. And you know, in the postal service delivery in world war two and why that matters to me, this is a tremendous group of black women, unsung heroes. A lot of people don't know them, but they deserve to be known. They deserve to be recognized. And there was a Senate bill and a house bill that was sponsored in this most recent con Congress that was co-sponsored and supported by scores of individuals that we all respect. Um, I wanna say several people in Maryland's congressional delegation, white and black, including I believe Congressman Elijah Cummings, um, senators like Ben, uh, uh, like, like ben Cardin, Chris Van Hollen, uh, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, all of these types of individuals uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle Passed through unanimous committee consent. Can anybody read? And it? when it got to the House side, so guess, who, all black women. guess who didn't co guess who didn't support the bill? Guess who would not bring the bill to our vote on the House floor, even though he's majority leader? Congressman oh, oh. Steny Hoyer. What? Congressman Steny Hoyer won't recognize the six triple eight. He won't he recognize the six triple eight. Black women? 
These are black women and, and not just black women, because black women, that's a great thing in and of itself. Ooh. Black girl magic. I love it. But black women veterans, people Ooh. who serve people who serve this country at a time when we all knew that they hated us. They still hate us in many ways. But at a time when we all knew that they hated us, a country that hates you and you still serve them. That type of selfless love is something you only see. from Mr. Black Mr. Bob, Mr. Bob, yes, those were the black black women over there in France, weren't they? World I'm, I'm War One, sure. 1914 <laughs> to 1918. That 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 is that is yep. true, but I'm more concerned about the black women who are here today. That's a fact. But you know, and, but you know, and you know, I want Trump to go to jail for trying to amass a coup. Well, Absolutely. look, I, you know, I, first of all, first of all, the media made Trump. The what the same media that he calls fake, they're the ones who made Trump. Uh, you know, and they everybody. They, 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 I, I don't even want to, you know, okay, I, I, I don't know whether he's ever going to go to jail or not. I don't really care whether he goes to jail or not. But, I, you know, Trump, Trump, Trump laid bare the fabric of this country. He laid it bare. He showed, he showed, he, he called everybody to say, you know, you got to come, you got to show now what you really are, what you stand for, what you believe in. And, and in many, and in most instances, unfortunately, I, I, you know, we have, we have, we failed. We failed. We get we, instead of condemning, we, 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 we gave credit. We, we created an environment where he could thrive, where Trump could thrive. And, and, okay. and we, so, yeah, let me and, bring this back around. Kevet, you I, live, I you, you live in gorgeous Prince George's County, correct? I live in Greenbelt. Yay! And, how am I doing? I'm gonna do it like Ed Cop. You're doing good. Doing? You're doing good. You're doing good. All right, all right. Well, let me know if it ain't the truth. Oh, I will. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to worry okay. about that. Okay. Okay. okay, Mr. Mayor, who is Jacob Blake? I'm oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kevet. <laughs> Okay, so one thing I did want to say was um, there was a point I wanted to make earlier when you were um, bringing up the point about how you're going to go about your um, efforts to, you know, bring Mr. Hoyer out. Um, and Mr. Deshiel had asked that question. Um, and I think, and, and you stated very much what I was thinking about being able to approach those who really don't even know. I mean, honestly, um, I can't tell you, you know, I'm coming back into the loop from, you know, a long history of, of kind of being out of the loop, um, but choosing to be in this arena at this point in time, educating myself and becoming more familiar with, you know, what is going on in my area. I grew up in Baltimore, but I live here in Greenbelt now since I've come back to the States. Yay. So, <laughs> um, so the, the issues that are going on here, especially as a business owner, um, a black woman business owner are very important to me um, and dealing with the financial services field, because what I realized is not only are uh, business and politics hand in hand, but especially finance and politics, being able to make the changes that we need to see within our community from a government perspective is going to require the money that needs to be funded in order for those projects and those initiatives to actually happen. Um, but I want to commend you for you know making the statement that you're going to bring out information about him that people didn't know before. Um, but I also would like to caution you not to give him too much credibility in the eyes of those who don't even know who he is. You know, because yeah. there's a lot of young people who are not familiar with him and they don't need to be familiarized with him. What they need to be familiarized with is your character, just as you stated. They need well, to be familiarized with the initiatives that are going to be beneficial to them and how they can actually take a part in making a difference in the community and how they will be able to, you know, influence the decisions that are, are made about our community moving forward. You know, and I think that maybe, that, maybe, that maybe their parents, maybe their parents have a role to play in this. Absolutely. Well, we have to go to parents first in order to to get to our children. So we were talking earlier about you know introducing the children to you know the STEM program and Baya and being able to understand that it has to start with their parents being interested in teaching them about the significance of going to a black law school 
or going to a black medical school or going I, to a black engineering school. I, I, I would think that would be. And, and I would, I would think, think that as a as a as a child. Of I would think that would be the norm in a black county like Prince George's. That's the wealthiest black jurisdiction in America. It's not the norm anywhere. We don't make assumptions because we know what happens when you assume. So, so, so <laughs> what we can deal with is the well, we reality. We about public education too with Prince George's County. Uh, the wealthiest we black jurisdiction in the country that's the right at the bottom. We, we can talk, to, we can't talk together, we can sing together. Go ahead. Wealthiest black jurisdiction, but academically, it's at the bottom of the state with Baltimore City. Let me so, just add this Thomas V. Mike Miller, going back to him, wasn't he in charge going back to 1973 with the Maryland State Lottery when it when that first came online, Mr. Bob DeShield? He was, and and we got a, a a governor as of recent, Martin O'Malley, that pushed table gambling. So all of this lottery, table gambling, slots. Yet we have Baltimore City, Prince George's County, at the bottom of the heap. Something is fundamentally wrong. It's the community. It's the people. You know, it's you talk about well, where you know does the no, the force no, come from in order to leadership, lack of leadership, institutional racism, and holding them accountable for what they're institutional racism, Kevet. Yeah, yeah mother, absolutely. Let, but it go. takes us to be able to come overcome that one person at a time. We have to be able to come together as a community hey. in order to to move against what they're doing on a, a systemic, you know, yeah. level. We have to be I able agree. to, yeah, we do. We have to be able to train our children to think in a, a different yes. way than they thought yes. in the past. Just like you're talking, Mr. DeShiel, and you said about the historically black colleges and universities, it's not um, what used to be. It is us reminding ourselves of where we've come from. Because if we forget about that, then we won't even have a future. You know, so we have to know where we've uh, come from in order to be able to recognize where we are today in order to put Instagram, we on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook all day. You mean to tell me the same brain and that reach is, them there. You cut me off. This and I, reach I them there. The same people that go that they can't go to Google. I mean, Prince George's County alone has incredible black history they can. Of, of the ilk of Black Wall Street going back hundreds of years, at least a couple. It's not years. about what can be done, Donnie. It's about what people want to do and what they will choose to do. It's not about what can be done. A lot you of get what you get because you do what you do. You can't blame nobody but yourself for that. If if we, we don't know what responsibility we, for ourselves, absolutely, each and every one of that's us. My, that 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 is my point, and that's where it starts. Precisely. That if is we don't my, take responsibility we, for we, ourselves. We keep blaming other people. We'll never overcome any of these. I I couldn't so that's right, you, got, you got to open up the history book and read for but, yourself. But Donnie, Donnie, just, reading just is like fundamental. Yeah, but Donnie, hey, just well, like I can't learn the history for you. If you can't read, I don't know what to tell you. We can yeah, go to but, TikTok, Instagram. We know the latest videos. We know the latest it. dances. You can but share if we it. Don't know our own history, if we don't know our own history, is that my fault or your fault? Well, what yeah, you can do at Blake. the end of the day, <laughs> our history says is if you don't go out and vote for the people who have your best interests at heart and that you know what their platform is and that that platform represents what you need and your community needs. And then you go to the poll and then you elect the people who will do you the justice that you need for your home. It's not going to happen. I, I, it doesn't I, I stop it. there. You I, must not only vote, you must also stay engaged in the process. You must know your elected officials. The one you can vote, you must. Come on, Kevet. Yeah, you must. The same people that you vote for, you need to know their phone number, their address, their email address, where they live, where they work. It's not just enough to vote. You have to stay involved. And well, so, yeah, Don, the way that you but, do that is by informing people through using the same media that they're playing around on all day long. You go to TikTok Kevet, and you, Kevet, you, you know, create Kevet, a. You're right. You're right. I, I agree. You I couldn't agree. I, I couldn't agree. In order more. to raise their it's, level of listen. consciousness, if if someone is sleeping and and they're you know looking in another direction and you want to get their attention, you don't try to turn their head in your direction. You go stand in their line of view. 
that's how you get their attention. When you I, get their I, I attention, could, then you can sh- you know, shift where they're looking or, or you know, give them a different direction. But we have to reach people where they are first. Let's get and back to the end of it. Mayor Bird, what about and Jacob? Then, come woke, then we can change their level of consciousness and the decisions that they make. It's not well, about well, what well, they well, because Mr. a lot Mayor, of people hey, 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 Donna, you do know that black folk had slaves. You know that, don't you? I do know that. Okay. <laughs> Right. I mean, because we were in Africa and our own people sold us into slavery. So exactly. you know, are we going to focus on that yeah, or are we going to continue okay. to focus on the progress that we can continue to make? That's the reality. Are we going to okay. continue to focus on the progress that can be made and what's being are done, you done today? Are you done? Mr. Bird, who is Jacob Blake? Yeah, Jacob Blake is uh, another another um, uh, victim of this country's unwillingness to not only acknowledge but also act upon the the understanding that Black Lives Matter. Uh, he was brutalized. He was shot in the back multiple times. And justice. And, and 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 so look, we. It's always a different number, right? But it's always too many. That's the point, right? One shot in the back is too many. Ten shot. You know, Amadou Diallo got shot dozens of times. Yeah. We can talk about the numbers, but the principle is this. Injustice yet again. Injustice yet again. I was born in the year of Rodney King. And I'm mayor, you know, uh, through the year of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, William Green, et cetera, et cetera. Rayshard Brooks, all of these individuals. The, the number of individuals is countless. The number of shots is countless. But the justice is palpable. The injustice is palpable. And I'll just say this. As a black man and as somebody born in the year Rodney King and who was governed through these things, I personally have more of an, a, 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 an experiential understanding through my own experiences as well as friends of injustice that has been inflicted upon our people. Many black men, but also black women. How are we gonna uh, stop? How are we gonna stop the black folk who killing one another? I mean, so, I, so I, let me get I, I grew up in a southern town on the eastern shore. And I saw a lot of black folk get killed, but everyone I saw get killed, my friends and others, they were all killed by people that look like me. So let me let me get to that because that's a very important point that you raise, right? Violence in the in, in the black community is often inflicted black on black, if you will. Now, I know a lot of activists don't want to hear that, and I understand why they don't want to hear that. Because That's real. That, that, that does not erase the injustices that come from police brutality, racialized police brutality. But I'll say this, um, and this is something that people don't necessarily all want to hear, but you're right, that there are a number of problems that come from within the community and that are enacted from community member to community member. Um, you mentioned violence in terms of folks shooting each other, black men shooting black men, but also violence from black men against black women, uh, whether it's rape or, or um, domestic violence. These are all things that we cannot be okay with um, in the community. And and, and so when I, when I said that these are separate issues, I wasn't saying that we can't address them at the same time or that one had to be prioritized and the other had to be addressed 10 years from now. What I said, and I'll reiterate, is that we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to say, look, we can't be okay with us killing each other but we can't be okay with them killing us either. But I'll also say this to be very candid. When Tyrone kills uh, Jamal, somebody's going to jail, okay? Somebody's going to jail. Mm -hmm. But when Officer Rogers or whoever is killing uh, Tyrone, we know how that goes. And that is an injustice that we have to treat as unique as it is. And so that's what I say about problems from within. And you ask, what do we do about them? And who's responsible for educating folks about uh, history, about, uh, you know, politics and all of these types of things. And I'll say something that may be uncomfortable, but we have to say, and that is leaders. And that honestly starts in the home. Right. We have too many families where there's either uh, absent fathers, uh, neglectful fathers or fathers who are present, but not really teaching uh, young people. Uh, what they need to know. We well, also have everything. some fathers who have been alienated. Who have been alienated, right? And 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 so and so I'm not saying that they are not victims of their own circumstances as well, but the reality is this: if there's problems in the home, 
then there's problems mm -hmm. in the church. Amen. If there's problems in the home, in the church, then there's problems in the community. If there's problems in the community, then there's problems in the city. If there's problems in the city, there's problems in the county. If there's problems in the county, there's problems in the state. If there's problems in the state, there's problems in the country. And if there's problems in America, there's problems in this world. It starts, however, with the leaders in the home. I didn't say it's just on the man, on the father. It's also on the mother. And that partnership is one that over time in the black community has not been as strong as it needs to be across the board. And it has had consequences. Now, we thank those black women who have stepped up when black men didn't. But the reality is that's not the way it was designed to be. And that's not the way that we should be OK with it being forever. The reality is we got to do our part as leaders. And it starts there. Mayor Byrne, and, then we're leaders, and then when we're in positions like myself to be blessed with leadership, leadership positions that come from without outside of the home that are in the community, whether activists or government leaders, we have a responsibility to make sure that there's not a continued miseducation of the Negro, as Dr. Uh, Car uh, Carter G. Wilson once said. All of these things have to be done, but it uh -oh, starts uh -oh, with Wait a minute, wait a minute. You call my hero now. <laughs> now, now you got my, now you got my hero. Carter G. Wilson once said, those who, <laughs> those who have no record of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration that comes from the teaching of biography and history. If we want to inspire our young, young people, they need to know about brothers like Jan Masseliga. They need to know about Black Wall Street. They need to know about Wayne Curry. They yeah. need to know yeah. about Ronald McNair, who yes. was the astronaut who was killed in the um in that yes. space uh, incident. All of this is connected to the problems of today, because I'll <laughs> tell you this, and this is why it matters to me, legacy. You mentioned earlier education and STEM programs. One of the things that I want to focus on is expanding and increasing federal funding for TRIO programs like the McNair College Program, which a lot of people don't even know what that is. That's for young people who see themselves as one day being able, um, being, um, getting PhDs, that'll get more kids into STEM. And that'll support those ambitions and make sure that they develop and that they prepare for those things later. Also upward bound so that we have more young people who prepare for college. Look, Ms. Cavett, you live in Greenbelt. Um, and, I, and I don't know your whole family situation, but you know how many, it's so few of our young people who are from Greenbelt who ultimately get jobs at NASA or BARC. It's right there in front of us. And that's because we have congressmen like Stanley Hoyer that haven't said, you know what, let's make sure that there's programs in place to make sure that we're interested in rocket science, young black man. We, mm -hmm. we're going gonna, we're gonna to we're gonna try to put fuel to that fire. Right. Mm -hmm. If you've got an interest and it doesn't have to just be STEM. Right. We talk about that. But sports, whatever it is, we are not supporting young people's dreams through the government. We, we're, we're telling young black people, make it on your own. And so that 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 limits in some ways the opportunities that some of them young young people even see, you know, like the things that seem like they're easy, low hanging fruit, like rap or sports. I think those are great things. Um, and I'm not as much and of a fan of her. You mentioned it right there. The easy, low hanging fruit. It is yeah. that mentality of not wanting to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or even drug dealing. Like we can we can be mad at people for dealing drugs in the community. But if that's what. The opportunities look like if that's what the they're opportunities are, survival. That's what they look like to a lot of young people, especially that's young survival. black men. You know, that's with, right. with women, it's a slightly different situation. They seem to be more trapped to education, but young black men are are well, trapped into the encouragement. And because we have the perspective of of believing of believing that whether it's true or not, of believing that we will live long enough to get a master's degree or a PhD. And when you have a young man who is in a community and constantly hears other men uh, older than him, his age, talking about, oh, man, you good if you make it to 18. Oh, you good if you make it to 21. Oh, wow, you 25. You're phenomenal. You're doing great. No, it's yeah. starting at the early ages yeah. of 10 and 12 with those high hopes and those big dreams and, and planning that 20 year plan out for them in terms of what is your education and your career and your life going to look like, you know, the being able to help them see that vision from an early age is really essential. Mayor Bird, Mayor Bird, question for you. <coughs> how do we, how do we, how do we create the cohesion? How do we bridge the gap between your generation and mine? It, 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 because, that, because, 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 see, we've got to get, we, we, what we've got to have between our generations is not just passing the baton. There's nobody to pass the baton unless the, unless the parties trust one another. We, we we this are is a more we, question we, for you, Mr. Bob. Like, what's wrong with the older I, 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 I'm, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out from I, somebody I, from, I, from, from from one of the millennials. 
How, so how do I, I have, how do I get you to trust me enough so that when I tell you a certain perspective is the way it should be that that we don't end up in a debate about who's whose finger is longer than the other, so to speak? Did so, you just say look? Okay, you, I, 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 I would say I, I, I trust you as an elder. I trust so, you as an elder. I trust your judgment as an elder. I'm going to follow your leadership on this issue, even that though I may disagree. Elders, isn't that yeah. based on the elders' track record? I mean, when you look around our community here in Baltimore, for instance, there was a time when you had a Pete Rollins and a Clarence Blount. We haven't had them for 20 years. Leadership. And in Baltimore, politically, we've not had leadership for leadership. 20 years. Well, I, I mean, I mean, I but, but Mayor, what do you think? <clears throat> So I, I appreciate this question, um, you know, and, and, and there's several reasons I appreciate the question. Um, growing up, um, my parents, um, and, I, and I say this not to say anything negative, but my parents are older than many of the parents uh, of the peers with whom I grew up, my friends with whom I grew up. I, I remember uh, that when I was much younger, uh, my dad was in his 40s, and then I had a friend who said that her grandmother was in her 40s, uh, which nothing wrong with that um, at all. But I say this to say that part of the part of the gap is, you know, if, if, if parents, if parents are really, really young and they're almost as young as their kids, they're almost from, you know, that that's also something that makes there be a bigger generational gap between somebody that's 29, 28, who has parents as old as mine, right? Like me and another 20, uh, 28 year old who 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 has parents who are much younger so they're they're fr like like you're you're their grandfather or great grandfather and that's a that's just more distance there's just more distance but i'll also tell you this so so i'll also tell you this so but i also because of my parent and because of just other things in terms of my own personal care and and what god put me on this earth to do um i i i when i was 17 years old my my friends my friends, I was 17 years old. My friends actually started referring to me jokingly as grandpa, as grandpa. And the reason is I always have been a bit of an old soul relative to a lot of people my age. I care about black history, but I can tell you, although I've done a lot of my own research on black history, it is in part, it is at least in part inspired by my parents and at least in part inspired by the dreams of my grandfathers, right? One of whom uh, was a chauffeur for Mary McLeod Bethune and one of whom organized with A. Philip Randolph. When that's part of my family's story, my my appreciation and respect for elders, uh, particularly those who have ties to black struggles, whether it's on the Black Panther side or the Nation of Islam side or the traditional civil rights movement side, I have a high level respect for it, but it's because I have an understanding of, a passion for, and a commitment to uh, elucidating black history for our people. Look, the miseducation of the Negro omits black history from the curriculum of the public school system. I'm sorry, the public school system. And because it omits black history from the uh, public school system, you have a lot of young people who have no clue about black history beyond the gentleman behind me, Dr. King, beyond Malcolm X. We know, everybody on this call knows that black history is much bigger than Malcolm X Dr. King, R Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Tubman. And yet in our schools, that's pretty much what you get. And so, of course, there's not going to be an appreciation for uh, older, older black people uh, by some people, because to be they honest, don't they don't know. And look, that's if they were even paying attention when they were talking about Dr. King, which is his own other story. I, right? I was much more personal. I, I was talking about Mr. you. Mr. Bob, you. Mr. Bob, it's 1143. We we went forty five minutes over. It's time to wrap this up. Right. Mayor Bird, what are your closing comments? Why should people vote for you in June twenty twenty two to replace thirty nine year veteran Congressman Steny Hoyer, who represents Prince George's County, among <laughs> other places, the largest black, a uh, wealthiest black jurisdiction in the country, where Kevette Minor Kane resides and rests her head. Well, first of all, look look on this call. You guys will never talk with a guy like Stanny Hoyer. Think about this. You guys are great, brilliant people. And if you do, it'll be once in your life and it'll be a quick thing at a parade or it'll be at an event. I am of, by, and for this community. So we can get into a lot of issues. 
But what I want to underscore is this. We have in Congressional District 5 a House Majority Leader, but we do not have a congressman. Let me say that again. We have a majority leader, but we don't have a congressman. We don't have somebody that's in the community. We don't have somebody that's committed to the issues in the community who will touch the community and be touched by the community. And we have a congressman, for example, that never gave a floor speech on Richard Collins. That never gave a floor speech on William Green. <laughs> you understand how problematic that is because this is right here at home. Racism at UMD. Racism in the Prince George County Police Department, all connected to federal issues, national issues. And yet this congressman, because of his out of touchness, doesn't even think about it. Right. We could talk about all of these specific issues. But what we need is somebody who is up by and for the community. And from day one, I have not only been up by and for the community, I've been fueled by a prophetic fire that you cannot put out. a prophetic fire to serve the people that you cannot put out. You cannot underestimate that. Somebody who can not only serve our young people and the children of people on this call and the grandchildren of people on this call, but inspire them. Right. Barack Obama shouldn't be the only symbol of political progress in America. There should be a young black congressman that young people can look up to and say, you know what? He ain't go to Harvard, but he's from Prince George's County. He's from the state of Maryland. I grew up uh, wanting to be an NBA player. I'm not from Hawaii. I didn't go to Harvard. I don't have that same prototypical American story, which I, I have the Prince George's County story. Speaking of basketball players, I didn't mean to cut your speech, but you need to catch hold to that NBA superstar there and then. Uh, what's where, where's uh what's his name? Mary Eugene. Who's Kevin? Who's oh, the Kevin Durant. So, Durant. so Kevin Durant. So that's a great example. So, so one of the things that I dedicated this race to was Kevin Durant. And 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 that's uh, uh, you know unusual. Politicians tend to lift up other types of people other than athletes. Kevin and there's came back. he came back and Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant gave to this community. But think about it. Kevin Durant has invested in this community more than Stanley Hoya has ever invested in the community. And yeah, he has multi trillion do trillions of dollars that he can control as part of the federal budget. Not one year, every year, every year as as a person in house <laughs> leadership. And yet we. Yet we in the community have to rely on, and I'm grateful for it, by the way, but we have to rely on the benevolence of Jeff Bezos's uh, ex-wife to invest in HBCUs rather than the federal government. We have to rely on the benevolence of and the wealth of Kevin Durant to invest in recreation here in this community and in education here in this community rather than the federal Did government. You say reparation? Huh? Did you recreation. say reparation? Recreation. Uh, but yeah, reparations. So that's another thing. Stanley uh -oh. Hoy is not a co-sponsor <laughs> of the reparations bill. Okay. Jimmy Jackson Lee has a reparations bill. Stanley Hoy is not a co-sponsor of. Jim Clapper. Oh, Jesus. I apologize. I apologize. I tricked you into that when Donnie knows. Yeah, I did. I got it. Right in there. And so look, I'm about good trouble. He's about good old boys politics. I believe that in this county and at this specific moment in American history, with the weight of the pandemic, with the weight of police brutality, with the weight of racial injustice. I am way more suited to serve this district than somebody that has been there for 60 plus years. And we know the name, but we don't know nothing about the game. We don't know nothing about the game. It's a dirty game of old, good old boys politics that's been played for decades and it has not benefited us. We could, we, everybody knows the name, but they can't say, what does Stenny Hoya stand for? Nobody could tell you. And yet we see him all the time on TV, but never in the community. Never well, in the community. I think the biggest thing that um, we need to hear from you is, you know, the old saying, tell them, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them what you told them and tell them again. And you need that needs to be your mantra as you are doing what you need to do, period. Uh, how can people support you, Colin Bird, Mayor Bird? Thank you for the question. Yeah, go to www.facebook.com slash vote Colin Bird. Again, that's www.facebook.com slash vote Colin Bird. Like the page. Uh, you know, I provide updates there. Also on Twitter at, at Mayor Bird. You know, because I'm an old soul, I actually just, re, you know, mm. got up on Twitter yesterday because, you know, these young folks, I'm trying to keep up with them on this Twitter. Reality, reality is that's where we're going to center the Wake Up, Rise Up movement. The Wake yeah, Up, Rise Up movement is about making Come sure on. that the witness <laughs> is raised about the issues and about the individual that won't address the issues. Not the first time, not the second time. He'll never address them.
I Mayor, will. Mayor, Mayor Bird, why. let me say, I, I, I want to support you. I've got, I've got some friends in, in, in your county. Some of them have significant resources. Uh, Donnie can tell you how to get in touch with me. I'm happy to support you. I, I'm impressed by you, but I, I got to get you to the point. You've got to understand as a young person that that you've got to be able to select and identify the people in my generation who you're going to listen to. And and, I go, and it has to be a time when you say, yes, sir. And that's the end of the discussion. We don't debate so, it. We just move on. So you got to be, and you got to tell your generation that there are people in my generation that they ought to follow. <laughs> the same way. So, and I'm so done. Yeah. See you later, oh, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and, and I appreciate that. And get and I can convey it. I can convey that. And we okay. take care of that. Now, see y'all later. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Hey, you back. Thank you for choosing awesome. Greenbelt as your home. It's the greatest city on planet Earth. Thank you, Ms. Marcia. Thank you. Thank you, darling. We're, we're proud of you, Ms. Bird. Well. Thank you. Marcia, thank you. Thank you. Up to date, down tomorrow. Do your day and everything will follow. Thank you to all of those people online. Uh, all of you. Alexis, Angela Williams, Richard McLaren, Alexis Coates. Up to day, down tomorrow. Do your day and everything will follow. Nothing to it but to do it. Got to do it, regardless of how I feel. I am somebody. I am <laughs> like other people. Bye. Good morning, Baltimore. Good morning, Baltimore. Good morning, everybody. See you tomorrow. Shout out to Chomsky.